Try to bring your mind in harmony with the body, in harmony with the breath. Gently settle it down. So the breath can come in and go out with a sense of ease. You don't squeeze it too much. You don't force it too much. Notice when you're breathing in too long, there's a sense of squeezing it out, as if you're squeezing the last little bit of toothpaste out of a tube. Or when you're stuffing it in as you breathe in too long. As for breathing too short, there's a sense that the body's not getting nourished. So give the body some freedom. You simply have to watch it, stick with it. Years back when I was first studying with John Fuang, he'd use an idiom in Thai, and he'd say to catch the breath. And I found myself subconsciously tightening up around the breath in order to catch it, not realizing what I was doing, until one day I noticed it. I found that if I didn't tighten up around the breath, then it was a lot easier. So I went back, and being a typical Westerner, I took him to task for, why do you say catch the breath? He laughed. He said, I don't mean you're trying to grab hold of it, it's something that you Stick with it. Try to put as little pressure on it as possible so that it can have its freedom. Not enough pressure so that you don't lose it. There's an image in the canon of trying to hold a little baby quail in your hand. If you hold it too tightly, it's going to die. If you hold it too loosely, it's going to fly away. So try to find just the right amount of pressure. So the breath can have its freedom, but the mind can be with it. And then notice how it will change as things begin to settle down. This way when the mind and the body are in harmony like this, both sides benefit. The mind has a place to stay. The body has someone looking after it. One of John Lee's images is of a parent looking after a child. The parent has to make sure the child doesn't get sick, doesn't do anything wrong. And as long as the child is with the parent, the parent is at ease. And the child wanders away, or the parent is away from the child, there's always a sense of worrying what's going on. When the two are together, they're happy. It's the same way when the mind and the body are together, they're happy. A good place for the mind to rest and to gain, gain its strength so that you can put it to use. I've been reading a lot of pieces recently, people saying that the whole purpose of the practice is to just be in the present moment. There was one this morning, a quote attributed to the Buddha, saying, if you aren't where you are right now, stay where you are, be where you are, otherwise you miss your life. I can't imagine the Buddha talking about missing your life. But he does talk about missing opportunities. The present here is not just to be in, it's to do work in. We're already working in the present moment. The question is, are we doing good work? The purpose of the meditation is to give us better work to do. There's a passage where the Buddha talks about the five aggregates, and how fabrication fabricates all the other aggregates, including itself, for the purpose of something. Maybe for the purpose of entertainment, for the purpose of whatever, gaining, gaining a livelihood finding pleasure. There's always a purpose in the way we shape the present moment. The problem is that our purposes are often hidden to, to us, and all too often they work across purposes. When we make up our minds we're going to 
take on the practice. We're trying to put all our purposes in one direction, to find the end of suffering, to find the end of the way we're causing ourselves unnecessary suffering. And that's the work we do. As we chanted in the Dhamma Chakrabhuatana Sutta just now, we have our duties in the present moment, the duty to comprehend suffering, to abandon its cause, to realize its cessation, and do that by developing the path. So we focus on the, on the breath, not for the sake of the breath, but for the pur purpose of figuring out our own mind. And the best place to observe the mind is in the present moment. And the breath is in the present moment. There's no future breath that you can examine or past breath. Just the breath in the present. So as long as you're with the breath in the present, you're focused on the right spot. And that's where you can begin to see the movements of the mind in the present. Where are they going? What purposes do they have? We find those most easily by giving ourselves the purpose of just staying here with the breath. So that the other purposes will have something to run up against. Otherwise, it's all very liquid, very fluid. One purpose blends into another, blends into another, and before you know it, you're off someplace in the middle of the Indian Ocean. The currents can pull you without you really realizing that you've shifted from one current to the next. But if you have one firm purpose, you're going to stay here with the breath. Then the different currents in the mind will reveal themselves. This is why the Buddha said, when he was teaching meditation, he would always say, go do jhana, go do concentration. He didn't make a distinction between doing tranquility and doing insight. You're trying to make something out of the mind. You're giving the mind a purpose, a solid one directional purpose here to get centered. And in so doing, you have to deal with all the other purposes that might surface, that might complain, might want to get in the way, take you someplace else. That's where the insight comes in. Now, in some cases, something else comes up and you can see it right away and see right through it right away. It doesn't pose any problem to the mind. You just stay with the breath. These other things are like the crickets in the background. They're there, but they don't disturb you. Other things, however, come in and they take over. You've shifted from the world of the meditation into another world. And so as soon as you, real as soon as you realize it's happened, you try to get back. But you try to prepare yourself for the next time so that when the mind does shift, you see how it does it. This is where a lot of the insight comes in, seeing the steps, a little stirring of energy in the body of the mind. And then you slap a perception on it, like you put a label on it. This is a thought about X. It's a thought about the future, a thought about the past, this person, that person. And you can ask yourself, well, where did you get this? lineup of perceptions, you slap on things. Where did that come from? And can you catch the mind as it's deciding which perception it wants to go with? Sometimes there's a choice, sometimes there's simply an association. Certain thoughts have their little homes in different parts of the body. There'll be a little bit of tension in that one spot. That's your anchor as you're thinking about that thought. And then when tension comes up in that spot again, well, you associate that spot with that thought. So you just go with it. That's one way. Other times, though, the mind has certain agendas. There's things it wants to think about, or part of the mind wants to think about, and it will take anything as an excuse to pull a particular thought in its direction. So these are the things you want to watch out for as you try to get the mind still. Sometimes it gets very still and seems to have nothing going on for long periods of time, and you wonder, well, what should I do next? Well, watch out. 
that little voice says, what should I do next? That may be the thing that you should be looking into. We're always doing concentration. The question is, to what extent is tranquility going to be emphasized and to what extent is insight going to be emphasized? But they're both there in the context of the concentration. And they're both related to questions. The tranquility is related to the question of how can I get the mind to settle down? How can I get it to have a sense of ease here in the present moment? Feel at home here. Inside asks the questions of how am I shaping my experience here? To what extent is just a random fabrication? And how do I view these things so I can develop some dispassion for them? In the beginning, you apply those questions to everything but the concentration. Because you don't want to be dispassionate about a concentration while it's still only half-formed or half-mastered. This has to be your passion. This is the direction, this is the purpose that you give to your meditation. And the insights will come along. as you're trying to deal with other things that come in the way. It's only when concentration is really mastered that you turn the questions of insight on it. In line with that image that the Buddha gave, taking the raft across the river. As long as you're crossing the river, you need to hold on to the raft. It's only when you've got to the other side that you let go. If you don't let go of the other side and try to carry it around, it becomes a burden. So you don't try to develop dispassion for concentration until you sense that there's, there's going to be something better. As long as you're dealing with other things that are not better than the concentration, the concentration has to be your passion. That's what you're doing in the present moment. You're developing that concentration. So you can get deeper and deeper insight into the role the mind plays in shaping its experience. So that's why we go to the present moment. Not because it's our goal or because it's a wonderful place to stay, but it's the place where the work gets done. And when the work is done, then it opens from the present moment into something that's even outside of time. So this is the portal. But you can't get through the portal until you've straightened everything out in the present. So we're here. Partly because it is a restful place to stay, and it's good to learn how to rest here. But the resting is not for the purpose of resting. It's a, for the purpose of gaining strength. So we can do the work that needs to be done. And who says we need to do it? The fact that we're suffering is what impels us. When the Buddha lays out these duties, it's not putting himself in the position of someone who tells us what we have to do simply because he says so. But the nature of the problem of suffering is such that if you want to solve the problem, this is what you've got to do. And it's simply up to you to decide whether you've had enough suffering in life and are ready to take on these duties.